Good evening. Thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Karen Burkhardt. I am the Executive Director of the Colorado Springs World Affairs Council. On behalf of ourselves and our sister councils, World Denver and Colorado Foothills World Affairs Council, with whom we are jointly presenting tonight's program, we welcome you to this evening's program, Afghanistan, the Peril of Neglecting Democracy and the Rule of Law. We look forward to hearing tonight's speaker, Sarah Shays. With that, I will turn it over to John Krieger, Executive Director of World Denver, who will make further introductions. Thank you so much, Karen. And let me first just say how excited and proud we are to be partnering with Colorado Springs and with Foothills World Affairs Councils on tonight's program. And uh, it's my honor and pleasure to, in, to introduce our moderator, uh, who will then introduce our speaker for this evening. I think all of our councils, we all heard from our members uh, pretty clearly and loudly over the last few weeks, uh, a need to learn and hear more about Afghanistan and to go deeper than what we were seeing in headlines and kind of day-to-day -day coverage of the situation there. And it's a real credit to our moderator, Kim Savitt, who went out and found our speaker this evening, who made the connection and made this event possible. Kim is a board member of World Denver and much more than that, uh, a foreign policy and national security expert in her own right. And we're so fortunate to have her facilitate this conversation tonight and which we're all very much looking forward to. So on behalf of World Denver, uh, thank you all for being here this evening. And I look forward to handing things over here to Kim Savitt. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, John. I really appreciate that introduction. Welcome to all and thank you for joining us for this virtual evening. I'm honored to have the opportunity to introduce Sarah Chase. Sarah covered the fall of the Taliban for National Public Radio. She left journalism and then stayed in Afghanistan to try and help rebuild the country. She founded a cooperative in downtown Kandahar where men and women worked together, made soap and body oils from local almonds and apricot kernels and spices and botanicals, and uh, essentially to expand the alternatives to opium poppy production. Sarah learned Pashtu and lived without guards or barbed wire, and so gained a unique understanding of the local dynamics. Beginning in 2009, Sarah served as a special advisor to two commanders of the international forces in Afghanistan and then to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen. From early on, Sarah was convinced that corruption would be a key to the fate of the US mission in Afghanistan, and not just in Afghanistan. Her latest book is on corruption in America and what is at stake. I'm really excited now, 20 years after 9-11, uh, to actually be able to talk with Sarah and um, see where we're uh, with the Taliban going back into power in Afghanistan, see what the lessons learned have been. She is an expert in foreign policy and in military policy, and I am very excited to be able to introduce her to you. I hope you will ask questions in the, in, uh, as uh, Karen had mentioned, and um, we will share your questions with Sarah after we give her a chance to address a number of issues. First, Sarah, the news commentary is on everything that went wrong in Afghanistan, very little that went right. Um, we would really love to hear from you about your sense of our lessons learned. Thank you, and thank, thank you very much, Kim. And it really has been a delight to get to, even briefly, get to know you, because folks, Washington's a pretty small place, even among people who have lived in far-flung countries, and we have a lot of intersections. And I'm also absolutely thrilled to be back, except that it's not in person, to be back um, with World Denver and your sister organizations, which makes it even more fun. I also have a nephew who just graduated from the Air Force Academy and is with the Space Corps. So 
Let me just quickly, um, I want to touch on a couple of major points, uh, and there's a lot to talk about, but I sort of want to start with the most recent and pull back from there. So let me touch on the withdrawal and then some of the concerns that I have about, about some of the military aspects of how Afghanistan was, was conducted, but then get to the two issues that I think are central to how that mission failed. And they're not really military issues. And then finally, I will touch on lessons. I don't know if they're learned, but we could call them lessons to be learned. So on the withdrawal, you know, there was a lot of focus on, you know, the military aspects of that withdrawal. And Congress just called up, you know, the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, and the CENTCOM commander before Congress um, to sort of grill them about the specifics of that event. What concerned me was there was not really enough attention paid to the terms of the agreement that the United States signed in February of 2020, the Doha Agreement. This was according to uh, sources of mine who were close to it, uh, negotiated in Pashto between the US envoy Zalmay Khalilzad and the Taliban leadership with no other US official in the room who spoke Pashto. Um, the allies who had been by our side since 2002 in Afghanistan were presented with a fait accompli um, that we were leaving. And in fact, this year were informed of the date of our de departure. But in particular, the, the agreement effectively conferred sovereignty on the Taliban. Of course, the wording says we don't recognize the Taliban. But when you look at what we are asking them to do, for example, not issue passports to any or visas to any international terrorists, well, who issues passports and visas? Governments do. And so... In effect, by February of 2020, the Taliban knew that they were de facto going to be the government of Afghanistan. And then with that, they could go around and start doing this leaning on people. Hey, the Americans are going to leave. We're going to, you know, they've already delivered, you know, they're already treating us like a government. They excluded the government of Afghanistan from these negotiations. So it's inevitable, guys. You know, uh, uh, why don't you come join us? And I think that brings me to how Afghans wage war. And I think that's something we never fully understood. War in Afghanistan, in spite of how bloody the country is famous for being, is really more of a theatrical exercise than, you know, like World War II, World War I or II, which were mass casualties. War in Afghanistan is really about demonstrating the likely outcome having a maximum psychological effect on the other side, and then using pressure and intimidation and repeated you know, entreaties to get people to come to the other side, come join, basically to get your enemy to come join you. And what I would say is armed with the Doha agreement, armed with the certainty of the American withdrawal, and, and, and with an Afghan army that had been built so as to require the highly technical equipment heavy type of support that we had been delivering, the outcome was pretty, and it was pretty obvious. Um, it was not in doubt. And so that I think is why you really saw this cascade of surrenders across the country uh, that happened in such short order. And I guess that is where I have some issue with the, with the military, what really is part of the military's bailiwick in terms of how these 20 years um, unfolded. Why was it that in an insurgency environment, we, we mirror imaged, I think it was um, Milley, General Milley, who said that in congressional testimony, he used the expression mirror imaging. 
that we really built an Afghan army that looked a whole lot like ours, meaning it needed a lot of equipment. It was tied to uh, heavily reinforced bases. It needed air support. Isn't it interesting that the Taliban never needed air support, whereas air support and medevac were supposedly so crucial to Afghans? So I think that's a really big question that we need to ask ourselves. What was the incentive structure that drove us to build such an expensive and unsustainable military force, whereas conventional armies frequently lose to insurgencies, you know? And if we had built a much more mobile, lean, um, uh, quick on its feet, uh, type of almost a special force in Afghanistan, it probably would have been more successful. But the two issues that I really think are crucial in how this went were um, the role of the Pakistani military, um, Pakistani government, basically, and the role of corruption in Afghanistan. So I can talk about corruption for like all day and probably will. Um, so let me start with Pakistan. Um, we have heard that the Taliban arose inside Afghanistan around Kandahar. I lived in Kandahar for a decade and I spent a lot of time talking to ordinary Kandaharis who lived in Kandahar at the time, we're talking the early 1990s, and also who lived across the border in Quetta, Pakistan. And I also talked to a number of the key players involved in that moment of 1994 when the Taliban first came in. And the answers I got were absolutely unanimous. The Taliban did not arise in Afghanistan. They were essentially built deliberately um, concocted, if you will, inside Pakistan by the Pakistani Military Intelligence Agency, um, which, you know, it was the, the Pakistan's primary concern was the long distance trade routes across Afghanistan um, and the chaotic post-Soviet kind of turmoil in Afghanistan was um, hampering trade. And so, um, they went so far as to market test the Taliban. This is what villagers north of Kandahar told me, is that, is that people came and actually asked them, how would you feel if some religious students, you know, came and took all the chains, the warlords chains across the roads, took those down and stopped the warlords shaking you down at every street corner. Um, and people said that would be great, you know, because they had uh, quite a, um, positive image of religious students, right? These were young men who went and basically sat and learned at the feet of, of, of religious leaders. Um, and so that was 1994. And then I watched them recreate the Taliban starting 2003. When the first attack started happening, the attackers couldn't even stay overnight inside Afghanistan. They had to come back, go back across the border into, into Pakistan. And then, you know, this is a country that harbored Osama bin Laden, first by proxy in Kandahar, under the aegis of the Taliban that really were uh, essentially a, a child, a brainchild of the, of the uh, Pakistani military intelligence agency. And then directly in Abbottabad in Pakistan, that's where we found Osama bin Laden in 2011. And that was not just any old town. That was basically Colorado Springs. I mean, imagine a fortified, I mean, the, the, the building was massive. It had a barbed wire fortification, which in Pakistan, you don't get to build houses like that without it being okay with someone. And so, you know, recently I was, I was hearing actually an old radio show about the um, authorization for the use of military force, the AUMF, which was passed immediately after 9-11. It's about 60 words long, and it, it authorizes the president to use all necessary force against al-Qaeda and any entity or country that harbored al-Qaeda. Well, Pakistan falls under that uh, umbrella quite clearly. And in fact, the night that Osama bin Laden was killed, Pakistan scrambled jets 
they were so sure that we were going to retaliate with a punishment once we found him there, that they scrambled jets, and yet we did not. Add to that, you know, nuclear proliferation uh, to Iran and North Korea. And I think a- another big question for us to ask ourselves is what should the United States relationship be with this country? I mean, if this isn't a dangerous country uh, to us, uh, I don't know what is. And we have to ask ourselves, is it really the fact that they have a nuclear weapon? Are they essentially a country-sized suicide bomber? Um, And if so, is there an appropriate way to deal with that? On corruption, briefly, because I've written a lot about it and I would love to answer your questions about it. But let me just touch a couple of points. One is, we're not talking the isolated actions of of venal individuals here. What we're really talking about is um, almost the operating system of a network, which interweaves members of government with, you know, top business officials or, or implementing partners of U.S. development projects, for example, and out and out criminals, including in particular opium traffickers. So President Karzai's younger brother, whom I knew very well before he was shot in the head, um, he was both the head of the provincial council, he was a major opium trafficker, and he got a lot of development projects and, you know, was a key interlocutor of the CIA and, you know, was providing a lot of targeting information to us. And so he was experienced by the Afghan population, by the Kandahar population as quite an oppressive guy um, who was, um, whose subordinates were shaking people down right, left, and center, um, who was making out on all of this development money, Uh, and who was basically able to use the U.S. military as a weapon against his own rivals and opponents. Um, The second point here is that corruption is not victimless. We often think about it here as being a kind of opportunity cost. But in Afghanistan, you're getting shaken down by government officials on the street. And if they did it nicely, like if they said, look at, you know how low my salary is and I just, my my wife just had a third daughter and I don't have enough money for clothes for the second one, you know, something like that, people would give you the clothes off their own kids back, but that's not how it happens. And so people are being robbed, not just of their money, but of their dignity and they're getting indignant about it. And people in that situation tend to go to extremes. And so after I left Afghanistan in 2011, I started looking at other countries where there were violent religious insurgencies. And I found almost the same set of causes were producing the same effect. And in fact, I went back and looked at the Protestant Reformation, which was not bloodless, right? It was an extreme violent event. And you just read the 95 theses, it's all about corruption. And so I would just say that people who have the feeling that their sort of politics and economy are sewn up by networks of interconnected political and business and criminal leaders, and they have no recourse, they go to extremes and they do it in Afghanistan. And I think they do it here too. So lessons, I would say, looking overseas, the answer isn't never again. Let's never, ever try to do a foreign intervention, because I just don't think that's realistic. I don't think that, I think that within 10 or 15 years or less, we will end up, you know, conducting another relatively similar mission. We said never again after Vietnam, and then came Afghanistan. I think the lesson we have to take with us is that the quality of governance of the host country, of the government that we are supporting, counts. It really matters. These interventions are not just about killing bad guys, because bad governance will generate more bad guys than we can hope to kill. 
But for me, the biggest and most disturbing lesson of Afghanistan really has to do with us here at home. Um, you know, in Kim and my world, we talk about fragile or failing states. That's like a whole kind of concept. And I um, would often say in these conversations, you know, these fragile and failing states like Afghanistan before, you know, before the Taliban returned, and certainly now, um, they may be failing as states, but that's because the people running them aren't trying to make a state. They're not trying to govern. Their objective is self-enrichment. And they're incredibly successful at that. And these networks are very sophisticated, very adaptive. They can even, you know, reconfigure when some of their leading members are toppled or are prosecuted. Um, and they are absolutely achieving their, um, their own purposes, even if their government policies are failures. So let me just ask you to consider, and I know this is a tough way of putting this, but let me ask you to consider a few American policies. Two lost wars, an economic meltdown that almost, you know, collapsed the world economy, an opioid crisis, and I would argue a pretty bungled response to the COVID pandemic, that have cost between them or each several hundred thousand American lives and rampant galloping environmental destruction that has only sped up in the past 20 years. And now let's look at some of the industry executives who have been cycling in and out of government, right? Their network has been weaving back and forth between public and private sectors. Um, and who, or at least who have influenced these policies. And they are, you know, in the defense contracting world, they are investment firms and, and real estate giants, they're pharmaceutical giants and fossil fuel and big ag companies. How are the executives of those companies doing these days? Pretty well. So compare that to you know, the quality of the policies that they have brought about. Um, and so I would just say that you know, some people might say, well, that the kind of influence they wield is just politics. But in that case, maybe we should ask ourselves, have we become culturally corrupt if we consider that kind of revolving door, conflict of interest, and failed policies to be just politics? So with those three tough questions, uh, I see Kim wanting to uh, maybe ask some of her own. Oh my, Sarah, you have raised so many issues and, uh, and as expected, um, really challenged our community in lots of, uh, of, of ways. Um, there are so many questions and, and there, I want to first remind everyone, you can put your questions in the Q&A, um, but I'm gonna start with, with one of my own. And it's really, you know, you have known the Taliban uh, for over two decades. I was surprised to hear you talk a bit about their theatrical um, uh, processes, I guess, and, and Really, you know, for Americans who don't understand um, the, the actions that the Taliban take, uh, we find their actions abhorrent, um, not just when it comes to the governance and the way they do everything from the way they treat women, uh, the severe treatment of their enemies. You know, they, they, this is a, a, a very brutal um, uh, way of governing. And I guess even if you don't agree with it, do you understand why this is the way that it is? Especially when you say that it's a theatrical, uh, a, a bit of theater in their process? Uh, I don't mean, I mean, governing is, is theater also. You execute people in public, 
right? I mean, that's theater. But I was speaking specifically about war fighting. And I don't just mean the Taliban here. Let me give you an example. Um, I think it was in 2010. The Taliban put, I think it was four or maybe a total of six people in an unfinished building in downtown Kabul. They had a an old mortar. They started shooting toward the U.S. embassy. And in Kabul, the U.S. embassy and the military headquarters were across the street from each other. These guys start lobbing mortar rounds down there. They shut down the entire U.S. embassy and the entire ISAF headquarters they hit, everyone hid under the tunnels and, 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 and da, you know, in basements of buildings for, I can't remember if it was 19 or 23 hours, six guys. That's what I mean by theatrics. Um, and what you would often see would be, so I mean, I mean, psychologically, the maximum psychological effect for the minimum investment of you know, men and material. So for example, they would assassinate, it would be targeted assassinations and then hang the bodies on a tree, like of teachers or something like that, hang the bodies or pin a note to the body saying, if you do what he did, this is what's going to happen to you. And it is very effective in intimidating people. And so I'm contrasting that means of warfare, the way, you're right, it's brutal. But what I'm trying to say is it's, it's, it's relatively few horrific atrocities instead of World War I, like mowing people down by the tens of thousands. That's industrial warfare. And they actually, what they do is their, their means of warfare is the psychological operations. They don't, they don't use words for psyops, they use actions. So the, the Taliban, we always, we expect it to be an Islamic state and they say they're gonna be more moderate but their actions obviously speak louder than their words. A couple of questions have come into the chat, but do you think women in Afghanistan have any hope of maintaining even some of their independence? And how worried should we be about continued terrorist support by the Taliban? Okay, that's a lot right there. So <laughs> let me start by saying the Taliban aren't a they. There are two major divisions. One is a more Eastern group and one is a more Southern group. The East, and then you have in particular a kind of third little bit, which is the individuals who were, took part in the Doha negotiations. So one thing to realize, we talk about how ordinary Afghans, you know, have changed in 20 years. The Taliban have too, but not quite in the direction that they, that some of them want us to think. They've changed insofar as they've been watching the money spigot go pouring into Afghanistan. So you may be hearing all this stuff about how, oh, we need to have, you know, have continued economic support and all this kind of thing. These guys want to get rich. And the Doha gang in particular enjoyed some of that. They got to experience the hospitality of, you know, Qatar and all of that kind of thing. And so that it was Mullah Baradar who had been the chief negotiator, who was the one who was sounding the most quote unquote moderate. But the Southerners and the field commanders are not. And so there's been a very vicious fight between the sort of Easterners and the Southerners. They've come to blows, in fact, according to my information. So this hasn't played itself out yet. I would just say that I would ignore the statements about moderation, as you say. Um, it was coming from one individual and it's been completely swamped. Um, women, now the second part of that question is also complex because I didn't live in Kabul. I lived in Kandahar. And my the women in my cooperative, I had men and women working together, which is even more revolutionary than just women. But these were widows and they were village women and they were very ordinary women. 
And their lives didn't change all that much. You know, I mean, yes, they could come and work with me. They certainly came in burkas. Uh, we did have a mixed group, but we would drop them off in a taxi. We bought a taxi and we would drop them off a few blocks away from their houses so that it wouldn't look too suspicious. Uh, every single one of those women, women had been beaten by her husband, I asked. And, um, and so I would just say that what we're hearing about the opportunities for, for women, I mean, we did also have an accountant who had, who had uh, graduated from high school um, and who had learned English and things like that. But I'm just saying that the picture we get is a cobble centric picture. And I do think that the lives of many women, not that the, of most Afghan women, not that they're good, but they won't change as dramatically as the lives of women in some of the metropolises will. But that means that there really isn't much of a hope under the current dispensation for women in Afghanistan for the next generation. As far as terrorists are concerned, I think the best question, the best way to understand that is to think about what is in the Pakistani military intelligence agency's interest. I think it is in, in the ISI's interest to, ha to, to have terrorists in Afghanistan who might attack India. The Pakistani military loves that because so long as India is riled up against Pakistan, then there's every good reason to have a military dictatorship in Pakistan, right? Like what, we can't have a civilian gov government if we're up against an existential threat. That's why an existential threat is actually to the benefit of the Pakistani military government. And that's why they love to keep needling India. I mean, if you're really afraid of India, why do you keep, you know, like poking it in the eye? It doesn't make a lot of sense. And so I can easily imagine occasional forays into India from Afghanistan. Um, but I don't think that it is in Pakistan's national, in pa even in the Pakistani military's interest for there to be major international terrorist attacks emanating, you know, against Europe or the United States emanating from Afghanistan. So that means that we might find ourselves in the very weird situation of allying with the Taliban and their Pakistani backers against ISIS. And that is, I mean, that's a nightmare that I can see coming down the line. Um, we've got a lot of questions coming into the chat. I'm trying to, to bring them yeah, back and see if we can do this, but um, I'm going to go to this one. Um, after the taking of bin Laden, would an investment by the U.S. in humanitarian aid, development, and good government governance have produced better results than investing in a military mission, which was declared by the Taliban as a foreign occupation? And I think I would add to that is, should we continue, given the disastrous human humanitarian situation in Afghanistan, should we continue to try and provide humanitarian assistance? And um, how does that play out, uh, particularly given the corruption issues with the Taliban? So I would reverse the order that the questioner put. What, what was it? Humanitarian development and good governance. Right you have to reverse it. Good governance has to be first. Every bit of humanitarian and development assistance needs to be conditional on governments treating their citizens like citizens and not either like booty to be pillaged or, you know, what have you. And so my feeling would, you know, so I do think, I think 2011 was late, but certainly 2009, President Karzai stole an election. And that was a perfect opportunity for the United States to really impose some, some, some serious conditions. And I was part of an effort to define what those conditions would look like. And again, I mean, it was interesting. It was a huge interagency fight that went on for like a year and a half, year and some. 
And, um, you know, basically it was like my boss, the chairman of Joint Chiefs, got this and he was pushing for a tougher approach to the Afghan government. But it was frankly the State Department and civilians that really refused to address the corruption issue at all. And I think the CIA played an important role also because a lot of these people were their so-called assets. And so they were um, supporting individuals who provided them with targets, even though those individuals, as I said before, were by their behavior creating so many more targets than we were able to kill. And so... um, I would say that, yes, um, a reduced focus on tactical military efforts and an increased focus on delivery of a government that Afghans could be proud of and that served in the public interest would have made a gigantic difference. Today, I would offer the same kind of um, caution I don't want to see Afghans starving. And in fact, I myself am mounting a GoFundMe campaign to get a couple of hundred dollars into the hands of a dozen families that I know personally, right? And it's been a nightmare trying to get money into the country. These are people that I've known for, you know, 10 or 15 years. Um, But I think that as a government policy, any support needs to be very severely conditioned. And, you know, what do we do when we have agreements with hostile governments? And if the Taliban isn't a hostile government, I don't know what is. We impose verification measures. So there are conditions and then there are verification measures. So if one of our conditions is that women be allowed to go to school even after the age of 13, if that's a condition on aid, then let's make it a condition on aid and let's have, uh, you know, require the ability to go and visit schools. Um, and so that's that's how I would address that. Um, I guess there are so many questions coming related to that is uh, why can't we prosecute white white collar crimes, for example? Uh, where will the Taliban get operating money if not from USAID? Who's going to be providing it? Are the allies going to provide aid? Is the United Nations going to provide aid? And doesn't that mean we have to somehow be a part of that? Um, and uh, what other kind of financial help might the, the Taliban get uh, in Afghanistan? So let me start with the first one. Why <laughs> is it so hard to prosecute white collar crime? So um, my most recent book is called On Corruption in America and What is at Stake? And it really goes into that issue. And the reason is that we too are um governed by interwoven networks who's and and in these if you will corrupt networks the people who hold political office yeah they sometimes steer public money toward their own former companies or steal mattresses out of you know an office or something like that but that's not the most important thing they do the most important thing they do is re-engineer the instruments of state power to serve the network instead of serving the people. So an example that I use on white collar crime in On Corruption in America is the Supreme Court decision in McDonnell versus the United States. I don't know if you remember this case, which came down in 2016. It was the governor of Virginia who had very obviously accepted a bunch of bribes from this kind of fly-by-night businessman who was a tobacco guy who then was trying to make some kind of pill out of tobacco and then he needed, you know, uh, clinical trials, as we all now know, to get his pill FDA approved, et cetera. And he's giving, you know, loans and he's paying for the governor's daughter's wedding and the governor, you know, does everything he can to get the UVA, you know, University of Virginia system to, to run the trials. It doesn't but he is arrested and convicted of prosecution in federal court. The appeals court upholds it unanimously. The Supreme Court overturned the conviction and not by, you know, five to four, by eight to zero. And I looked at a series of Supreme Court cases in this book and they all come down unanimous, just about. 
So what I'm trying to say here is the people who, and, and, and you wouldn't normally think of justices this way, but certainly in Congress, in the regulatory agencies and whatnot, who are cycling in and out of business and those positions are also concerned about being prosecuted. And so they're quite interested in reducing the severity of prosecution and punishment for white collar crime, for I would say corporate crime and corruption. And I think a really interesting example of that was um, Kushner and um, criminal justice reform. And a lot of Democrats were really surprised about why is Kushner getting behind, you know, why is he suddenly interested in, in seeing a lot of non-white, you know, drug offenders being released from prison for their nonviolent crimes? And my answer is there are other kinds of nonviolent crimes that are actually much more dangerous to our society than minor drug offenses. And those are the ones that Kushner also wants to be sure that people don't go to jail for, as McDonald didn't and as Menendez didn't, because he also um, was in the end not prosecuted because of this McDonald decision. Um, so then it's about money for the Taliban. I think that Pakistan is obviously going to be supporting the Taliban financially. I think that um, Pakistan and the Chinese government are close. Uh, and so there will certainly be Chinese, I think, uh, involvement in Afghanistan, particularly because of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative and pa Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan could be a sort of Southern spur on the Belt and Road. And there are significant resources. Uh, China already has um, the license for the largest, I think one of the largest copper deposits in the world, uh, the IMAC mine. Um, I mean, it'll be interesting to see, I hate that word interesting. There are, I would say that Chinese, some Chinese officials have sugar plums dancing in their eyes. It may not be as easy to extract these minerals as they think it will, but I am sure that the Taliban will have no problem providing the authorizations so long as they get some of the millions. Um, I do suspect that Europe is going to be a little bit less um, focused on the conditions of humanitarian assistance. And I suspect also that all of our governments are gonna get a lot of pressure from humanitarian organizations, which like every other organization wants to want to stay, want to you know, perpetuate themselves. So they're gonna start saying how terribly important it is to send money to Afghanistan and let's not worry about these pesky conditions just like they did before, because they weren't particularly interested in conditions either. And I just think it is bad policy to throw, you know, to just open money spigots without, um, you know, without oversight. Um, that, leaving that, that side for a minute, um, there are so many different questions coming in. Um, one is, is very interesting in looking at the past, what roots of the last two decades of U.S. involvement in Afghanistan do you trace to how we engaged with it during the USSR attempted occupation? Very good question. And yeah. I would just like to say, I am happy to circulate my email address to the, the attendees tonight um, so that if questions don't get answered and people want to pursue them, I would be happy to do that offline. That's a great question. And the answer is, we allowed Pakistan to be our conduit for our support for the Mujahideen. And that meant that Pakistan could aim our money flow and our weapons toward those groups that it preferred. And it preferred the more extremist Mujahideen, not the more, you know, kind of the more jihadi ones. And uh, the fact is that going back to that period to the 80s, I mean, Osama bin Laden, it's not, it's not correct to say the Mujahideen were Al-Qaeda, but I have learned that Gulbuddin Hikmatyar, who was one of the bloodiest of these Mujahideen commanders, 
was very close to Osama bin Laden and would go to Saudi Arabia. I learned this literally just a couple of months ago from someone who witnessed it, would go to Saudi Arabia, pal around with Osama bin Laden, and in fact would bring Afghan women to be, quote, married, you know, to Osama's followers, essentially. And, and that was a money-making venture for the Mujahideen because it's a bride price um, marriage process. In other words, when you, so they would essentially be kidnapping Afghan women. They would sell them effectively. In other words, they would marry them to Osama bin Laden's followers in return for the bride price, which instead of going to the women's families would go to this, which I would go to Gulbuddin. That's the kind of thing that was going on. Um, and they were very, very closely linked. And so I do think that um, ironically, we were part of um, building the foundations for the, both the Taliban and Al Qaeda during that anti-Soviet episode. Uh, wow. one, there's, one other answer to, there's one other answer to that, which is that following 9-11, there was very little Afghanistan expertise left in the American government. So when I showed up uh, and decided to stay, I mean, in early 2002, I'm kind of going to Kabul and, and, and it's like, where's the Marshall Plan? Like, where's, there was no one home at the embassy. There was, I remember interacting with one guy, there were six week rotations. There was a guy who had been called out of retirement who had served in Iran and he was called back because he spoke Persian Dari, he spoke one of the Afghan languages. But the, it was, you know, and then it was later that I learned that as early as February, 2002, most of the US military and diplomatic apparatus was already pivoting toward Iraq. And that's why there was nobody home, you know, in the US embassy in Kabul, who did have some, I wanna say, um, collective memory on Afghanistan was the CIA. But who had they interacted with during the anti-Soviet period? With the ISI. And so that is what caused a kind of pro-ISI bias also to infect the early years. I think by the later years, certainly the US military was on to um, the ISIs, the double game is a, is a, frankly, is a generous way of putting it. And my own boss, Admiral Mullen, um, testified his final testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee. He called the Taliban a virtual arm of the ISI. But that was 10 years later. Well, it, it leads to another question that was asked early on, and that is, is it conceivable that the US military and President Biden actually thought the government and the army in Afghanistan that we had built, right, would survive months and years as they had, had early testified? Um, I how, think- How could they have been so surprised? I think it is possible that they did think that. I think it's possible that they at least thought it would survive for months. I'm quite positive that Khalilzad had no such illusions. I think he knew exactly what he was doing. This is a man, incidentally, who had lobbied on behalf of the Taliban in the 1990s. Um, and so I am very curious as to on whose behalf he was actually negotiating, frankly. Um, and the reason I say it's possible that the US government and military did think that is one of my best Afghan friends, who in fact had been appointed Minister of the Environment, would you believe, in about April. And I was telling him, would you get out of the country? And he's like, I've been given this, this responsibility, I'm going to do it, you know, and he was working like a maniac and happened to be out of the country to sign a treaty with Tajikistan about the Amu Darya River when Kabul fell. He was shocked. He's Afghan and he was shocked. I was shocked that he was that shocked. And what I have to say is, I think, you know, it's cognitive dissonance. It's when you have invested so much in something, it becomes very difficult. You know, it's like email, it's like um, internet dating scams. I've heard a lot of these stories where the warning signs are all there. 
But once someone starts to commit to something and invest in something, it becomes, there's a kind of willful blindness that sets in. But as I said, I think part of the blindness on the part of the US military has to do with this fundamental misunderstanding of how Afghans do war. That what they do is posture, gruesome, a few gruesome killings, and then negotiate. And so this negotiation was going on, this local level negotiation was going on um, for months. And I talked to friends in Kandahar who said, everybody knew it, the whole world knew this was happening. And, and so that's where I say, you know, we missed it because we didn't understand that's how they operate. And we also missed, again, the Pakistan dimension. How do we so convinced ourselves that the Taliban were some kind of ragtag, you know, autonomous bunch of fighters? Come on, how does a disorganized set of opportunistic killers execute the type of sophisticated and synchronized and geographically astute campaign that they did in the past six months. They had to have had sophisticated command and control. And that was across the border in Pakistan. So, you know, when you're allied with your enemy, if you're able to swallow that one, there's a lot of stuff you're gonna miss. Sarah, you have uh, you've covered such an extraordinary array of uh, issues and questions, but I have to ask you, um, your professional journey seems to have taken a lot of sharp turns from award-winning journalism to innovative policy and analysis to working with the U.S. military. How have you... Don't, don't forget about making soap. I and make, and, make, and making soap, making and soap, making soap in soap. Kandahar, Afghanistan. <laughs> so, so given this extraordinary twist and turn, um, you know, your your newest book is about uh, uh, corporate and, and corruption in America. What's next? Hmm. Funny you should ask. Another twist, <laughs> and it's really um, challenging. I mean, and this is a gal who lived in downtown Kandahar, and I'm finding this one exciting and in some ways equally challenging. I think the most important issue facing us today is the human relationship with the natural world. If we don't get this right fast, and I'm not just talking CO2 in the atmosphere, I'm really talking about reintegrating ourselves as a species of animal with the entire biosphere in which we are interconnected. Um, and corruption plays a big role in that issue too. As I you know, mentioned, pretty much every type of environmental devastation that you can think of, scratch the surface and you'll find some kind of corrupt relationship with logging companies or fossil fuel companies or mining companies or, uh, or narcotics traffickers or whatever behind it. But I am really trying to enter into the kind of relationship with the natural world that I entered into with Kandaharis. And so my next book is going to be a kind of natural history of the Potomac River, which is a, an absolutely magnificent, magnificent, mighty river that flows by this capital. And most people in this capital of the United States don't even notice it as they commute across the bridges every morning and every evening. Thank you for asking me. Well, as, as someone who has fished the Potomac, um, I'm very interested. I can't wait to see what you're going to write next. Um, there has been, a, I guess, an enormous interest in uh, your books in the past. And particularly, um, I've got one more question I wanted to ask, and that is, in your newest book um, on corruption in America and what is at stake, you talk about links to corporate boards, the magnitude of corruption, how do we get Congress to recognize this, this kinds of, these kinds of corruption and take actions? What should we or could we be doing? Yep. 
And I will just note that it is coming out in paperback at the end of November. So um, basically, I want you guys to pre-order it now. So like, don't forget about it. But don't, I mean, don't buy the hardcover now. The paperback's about to come out. Um, so, I mean, I think what we don't, I, I, I use the metaphor, I use some mythology in this book. And I use the metaphor of the Hydra, that many-headed Greek um, monster, ancient Greek monster, to describe the corruption networks as they operate in the United States. And I kind of go through the elements of state function that they either capture or distort or hollow out. And the problem is, as I say, these hydras are made of the, pr the problem with Congress is a lot of members of Congress go off and lobby after they've served in Congress or their staff members do, or they take positions on boards. And so they are part of the interaction with, um, I mean, the sort of intermingling with um, uh, major corporations, not to mention that that's where most of the campaign financing comes from. What I have learned in looking at other countries is that the most effective weapon that kleptocratic or corrupt networks wield against the public is identity divides. So long as American citizens continue to have 2020 vision when noticing corruption on the other side of the political aisle, but suddenly their eyesight dims when they look at their own camp, we are gonna lose and the corrupt elites are gonna win. The only way that we can get our elected officials to take corruption seriously is if we, we the voters, turn it into a, a, a cross-cutting, uh, basically come up with three or four cross-cutting ethical principles on which, on the basis of which we are willing to vote. I mean, a, a kind of abortion or guns or no new taxes or that, that ethics I think needs to be our single issue and we need to be, and we need to join forces across the political divide because as it is now, the, the people making out on top are basically rival corrupt networks, right? And so they're at each other's throats and they've got some social, some differences on social policy, but shockingly few differences when it comes to kind of corruption and corporate personhood and, and all that kind of thing. As I say, the Supreme Court decisions were unanimous. So they're rivals, but they're all making out. Whereas we, the ordinary people, the voters, we are at each other's throat and we are throats and we are, and, and until we can come together, they're gonna keep laughing all the way to the bank. And unfortunately, all the way to the destruction of our polity and our environment. So for me, anti-corruption is the most crucial issue that almost undergirds every other issue. And it's the most, I think, um, it's the most important challenge facing, facing this generation. Sarah, I wanna say thank you. Um, it has been a most interesting hour. I am really appreciative of uh, your, the breadth of your knowledge and experience. I am going to turn the uh, uh, camera back to Joe Shaw and, uh, uh, understand we're uh, coming to the end of our, our hour, but thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you, Kim, for also for juggling a bunch of questions. I will send um, my email address to all attendees, and I just want to thank everyone who is participating. You know, I really wish we could be doing this in person and hang out for a chat afterwards. But I just think your, you people's ongoing um, support and devotion to the spoken word, I mean, with all of the stimulus that you have coming at you, that you're willing to spend an hour of your evening in this kind of a discussion, I can't thank you all enough. And thank thanks you. to all of the world affairs the three of you for, um, you know, for creating the space for it. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much on behalf of the Colorado Foothills World Affairs Council 
as well as the other two councils for your very provocative talk. Your comments on um, uh, the, th the lessons from Afghanistan were particularly interesting to me. I'm coming to you right now from Southern Brazil, a country that is very much on edge uh, with a very unpopular administration, a president who desperately wants to hold uh, the reins of power and elections coming up in a year or so. And you can't have a political discussion here without every other word being corruption. So they're very relevant, not just in Afghanistan, but elsewhere. Again, thank you very much. And everyone, have a good evening. Goodbye.